Welcome. In this video, I'm going to be talking about um, some more advanced things that you can do in Sphero coding, um, things that include variables, communications events, uh, and functions. So let's dive in. Um, the first thing uh, that we should address here are variables. And variables you might remember from um, algebra class. These things are basically just placeholders uh, that can be really anything. <laughs> Um, that you want them to be. And that's the way that they work in Sphero coding too. Uh, so they can stand in for some number or they can stand in for a true false, something called a Boolean, or they could stand in for text. The ones that we're gonna focus on are the number based ones and the Boolean based ones. So if you wanna make a variable um, in the Sphero EDU app, you just go all the way over to the right, you find out where it says variables there. Uh, and then from there, uh, you can create uh, a variable. You can uh, give it a name, and then you can decide what kind of variable you want it to be, a number, stand in for a number, a Boolean, like I said, or it could be a string, which is just that that text. And so then once, once you've created a variable, there's a couple different ways that you can use it. Um, the first way is as kind of a number. In this case, I created this variable called loops. And because it has these curved sides, we know that it can fit into operators the way that any other number might. Uh, and so that's what type of variable that is. And then the second thing that we can do is we can use this coding block here called set variable to decide what number we wanna give uh, this variable called loops. So it could be, um, we could set it to zero or we could set it to any other number that we want, or we could actually code um, for what it should be set to. And I'll explain that and show some examples as well. So here's a program that I wrote, just a very simple program that uses variables. Um, I created a variable, I called it countdown. And then I, uh, when the program starts, I set use the set variable block to uh, set the countdown variable to the number five. And then I have a loop right here, and I'm gonna have this loop five times. So it's gonna go through this uh, kind of strand of code here five times and go back up. All right, so the first thing I'm telling it to do, just breaking down the code, I'm telling it to give me a single matrix character. So on the LED matrix, I built a string, which you can do as an operator. And inside of that string, I put a number and the number is countdown. Because I set countdown to be the number five, it's gonna show a number five on the bolt first in green. Then I tell it I want to speak, and I use that same string. So it's going to speak the, the countdown number, which at this point is 5. And then the last thing that I do is I do another set variable command. And I'm setting the countdown variable now to an operator. This is just that basic math operator. And in this, I'm using what it was before. So it was 5. And I'm subtracting one from that. So the new version of countdown at the end of this loop is now going to be four. And so now we go back up to the top of this loop and the matrix character now that it's going to display is the new version of the countdown variable that's been set to four. So it's going to show four and then it's going to say four and then it's going to do this again. Now, instead of being five minus one, now it's four minus one. So it turns out to be three and you can kind of see how the loop would continue. And so I actually ran this so you can get a sense of what it looks like on the bolt when it runs. Five, four, three, two, one. And so it just ran through that loop just like you'd expect. And it said the number and it also uh, showed it as a matrix character in the color that we specified. And every time the loop went through, it changed because I had this set variable to a different number. So another way that you could use this is as a way to um, pull out sensor data uh, and then kind of hold it for use later. And so in this particular program I'm showing here, um, I want the bolt to roll at zero degrees away from me at a speed of 35 for six seconds. And at that point, I want it to set, um, I define this variable dist1 or distance1. And remember, the distance is the total distance traveled, distance traveled by the bolt. On, in the program so far. And so I set dist one to whatever that distance is. Then I have it do kind of phase two where it continues to roll away from me at a different speed for a different amount of time. And when that is complete, I set another variable that I created, dist two, to be the total distance. 
And so this total distance traveled at this point is going to be different and bigger than it was before when I set dist one. Then I'm going to kind of repeat this process one more time, rolls away from me at a different speed for a different amount of time. And I'm going to define dist three, yet another variable I created to be the total distance at that point. And so if you kind of think of this, the bolt kind of went away from me, the first leg, and then it went another way as the second, and then it went another way as the third. And so now in the program, I have dist one saved, I have dist two saved, which is that, and then I have dist three saved, which is the whole shebang, like that. All right, and so then I have uh, a loop that occurs where I want it to scroll text across the, the matrix. I put in a text part of my string, and then I also put in a number part of my string. And the number part of my string is going to be dist one. All right. And that tells me how far did my bolt go? If I can use a color here, how far did it go in that first leg? If I want to know what the second leg was, so the next thing that I have the bolt do is do scrolling text string again, just like before I have text. And then now I put in this operator and the operator is going to take dist two, which is right here, take away dist one. And what I'm left with is kind of what this is right here. And so now I know how far I went in the second leg of the journey. And then I repeat that process one more time using leg three. Now I'm gonna take the third distance, which has everything, disc three has everything, minus disc two. And that tells me what I end up with for the last leg. And so that's a way that you can um, kind of save out uh, sensor data to different variables and then use it later um, when it's convenient for you. Uh, there's another kind of variable that I was always very confused about for the longest time called the Boolean. It was a weird word, um, but it turned out to be, you know, fairly simple. So just stay with me here. So uh, Boolean variables work like switches. There's an on and an off, and they think of the on and off as a true or a false. So basically, uh, the way that these variables work is you define them and then you say either it's true, it's on, or it's false, it's off. And you can just turn them on and off based on what you need. So here you can see um, I created this program that uses a Boolean variable. And what I like about Boolean variables is they basically allow you to get two programs in a simple sense for the price of one. And I think this is really uh, helpful for educational applications because sometimes you might want your students to just change uh, a variable from being true to false. So I, the first thing that I do here is I set the with sound variable that I created and notice now it's a hexagon variable as you see it fly in here in the GIF. It's a hexagon variable, so it's, it's a Boolean or it's a true or false variable. And I set it to be true. And then I have an if then statement. So I'm basically saying if with sound is true, then I want it to play a cool spaceship noise and roll at 45 degrees for this, you know, this speed for that many seconds. If it's not true, so say I set this and you can, you can set this to false. Basically, again, turn the light switch off. Then, so if it's not true, it'll go to this else part. It'll skip over this first part right here and it'll go down here and it'll just do the rolling part. So it's still doing, you know, what I want to do. It's still rolling, but now it's doing it without sound. So in that way, this Boolean variable allows me to modify my program to run differently based on how I set it true or false. That's just a very basic application. There's obviously way more complicated ways of using them. So bolts also kind of have this cool thing where they can communicate uh, with each other. They can send and receive information through infrared. That's what IR means here, infrared. And this is the same way that remote controls work for your TV. So the cool thing about a bolt is that it has uh, four of these clusters. Uh, it's a different color. Uh, actually in the bolt that can send and receive um, infrared um, messages, infrared signals. And here's a close up of the kind of uh, the sensor and emitter apparatus. And uh, one thing to note when you're trying to do communication between bolts is that they need an LOS because uh, infrared light is light, even though you can't see it. And 
because it's light, uh, it can be blocked by certain things, um, stuff that gets in the way. So you need a line of sight in order to make sure that you can send uh, and receive messages between the bolt. The good news is that because of the placement of these emitter and receivers on the bolt, the orientation of your bolt uh, to one another don't really matter as long as they have that line of sight, as long as they can see each other. Because basically, um, they're kind of like an infrared eyeball over here and an infrared eyeball over on this guy here too. Nothing creepy about that. Okay. So um, on a basic level, these bolts can communicate each other um, using uh, broadcasting and then uh, the receiving one does something based on the broadcast. So a broadcasting robot you can use this block right here and it broadcasts on two channels, um, combinations of two, zero to one, and it goes up to seven, um, but they can be customized based on what you need. And what happens when you um, have a bold broadcast is it's sending that signal out in all directions to any bolt out there that can potentially see that infrared signal. And then you can have a receiving bolt either follow or evade. And so basically what uh, this bolt is doing is it's on the lookout. I'll draw it a couple different ways here. On the lookout for those signals. So you can set your bolt that receives those to either follow the broadcast, which means that basically like it just plays follow the leader. It goes towards, towards the signal if you want. Or you can program the, uh, the bolt to evade, which basically means that it runs away from the signal. Wherever the signal is coming from, it runs away. Which ends up being kind of funny. If you have a bunch of bolts trying to evade, they all look like they're running away from like a, a shark or something, like little fish running away from a shark. So that's kind of a basic way that you can do it. Now, um, the two different bolts would have to be running um, different uh, programs, probably, um, unless you get real fancy. Different programs. Uh, one, one bolt would be running this kind of broadcast um, program, and then the other uh, bolt would be running... Uh, a program that has these follower evade uh, blocks built in. Another more advanced way to do communication between bolts has to do with sending and receiving messages. And so um, bolts can send uh, messages. They can send eight different messages coded zero through seven. And the intensity of those tells uh, the bolt uh, how intense the signal should be. And so if you happen to be working uh, in an area where a lot of people are using bolts, um, you might want to go more on the low end intensity uh, where there's lots of bolts uh, because you don't want to necessarily influence the behavior of um, a bolt that you, know, you don't intend to. So uh, when I first learned about these messages, I was super pumped and I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to send like whole blocks of code over from one uh, robot to another. And it turns out that that's not the way that these things work. Basically, all you can send is a signal of a number. However, those numbers that you send over to the other uh, robot that's receiving them can influence that robot to do different things. So there's something called an event. And in this case, um, it's Basically, this bolt is set up to, if it receives message four, it will do certain, certain code blocks. So basically, you put a bunch of code blocks under this, and it will run those code blocks when it receives, when and if it receives uh, message four. Um, and so in that way, you can have this bolt on the left here, based on its message it's sending out, this other one has its IRI looking out for any messages. And when it receives it, it's getting that as a command, like, oh, okay, well, I got message four, now I need to do this. And if it hadn't received message four, it wouldn't kind of go through um, this bit of code. It would just kind of go about its business otherwise. So that's, that's a way that you can have one bolt communicate with another and influence its behavior beyond just like run away from me or come towards me. So here's an example of um, a program that I wrote that, that kind of makes use of um, this, this message communication. In this program, basically what I have it set up to do is run a loop where um, I spin this bolt, because remember, yaw has to do with kind of spinning 
from side to side and I spin it and maybe if I'm spinning it counterclockwise then this yaw gyroscope which is going to keep track of spin will be greater than zero so that'll be true and if that's the case then it's going to send a message of uh, zero to, at the max intensity because maybe it's the only bolt around if however I had spun it the other way clockwise then this yaw gyroscope would actually be less than zero if that's the case it'll go down here and send message one to the receiver robot and then you set up your receiving robot which is again looking out for those IR signals looking and waiting and it's receiving one of those signals and based on which one it receives it's going to be doing something different so if it receives um, message zero this is the one where we have this guy spinning around uh, counterclockwise then this bolt will also spin counterclockwise it'll be a sympathetic robot on the other hand if um, we're spinning clockwise over here or if I initiate a spin clockwise uh, this yaw gyroscope is going to be less than zero and then it's going to send message one and that message one is going to connect uh, and tell this this robot over here to do a clockwise spin of 360 degrees in two seconds and so basically uh, depending on which way I physically spin the robot over here on the left the robot here on the right is going to match the direction of the spin based on the messages that get sent So I alluded to this before, but um, just talking specifically about um, events, we can use events, which are uh, specific occurrences that the robot can sense uh, to cause strands of code to run that would otherwise not run. So here's kind of an exhaustive list of um, the events that we can have. Uh, and I'll go through these kind of individually, the ones that merit that. But on a basic level, kind of what happens normally when you're running a program is that uh, it kind of goes down the list of your code blocks. So here it's going to set the speed to 50 and the, the heading of your robot goes here and it's going to delay for five seconds, meaning it's going to go at that speed and heading for five seconds. Then it is going to change or keep the same speed, um, but change the heading and go away from you if you oriented it correctly at the outset. So it's just going to go along its merry way and do that. What an event does is it sets up a scenario where if, if something specific happens, it actually causes the a break in this code so instead of kind of running all the way through this code normally here on the left it will instead divert and so say that like there's a collision that occurs uh you kind of the robot hits something then it's going to bounce over from this point maybe is where it happened and it's going to come over here and then run this code in this case, it's going to stop the robot, say I've got rhythm for some reason, and then strobe the light um, on the, uh, the LED matrix uh, for four times at a, at a small interval. So it kind of diverts over and runs different code based on that event that occurs. And then uh, one of the cool things is that if there's still code to run, so if it bounced over at this step, at the delay step, uh, once all the code in the event is kind of done and has been run through, it will come back to the main kind of strand of code and then complete it. Um, and that gets a little complicated based on the codes that you're using and whether like the event code just kind of continues or is looped or something like that. But on a basic sense, it will pop back uh, if there are still um, codes to execute. So one of the ones that's really common to use is this on collision. It's based on acceleration. So if you like hit the robot in your hands, like clap it between your hands, or if you kind of drop it on, on a table or something like that, or it runs into the wall, um, it will trigger this on collision event. However, there is significant force that's required for this. Um, I've tried to set up uh, on collision events before and, and had it uh, been disappointed because it kind of bumps into something and it doesn't actually trigger the event. So just know that if you set this up in your programming that you need some force uh, on that collision in order for it to trigger. This is an example of a, a program that uses that. So I would, um, I like to code in 
something that's going to happen at the outset of the program regardless uh, just to make sure that i know it's on and ready to go and then on collision so i'll bump the robot in my hands or clap it in my hands i'm going to have it speak roll the die delay for a second and then i'm going to have it show a single matrix character on the led matrix and then i built this string and inside of it i put the operator telling um, the program to pick an integer, or in this case, a whole number. That means a whole number between uh, one and six, the same way that you'd have in a die. And you could get fancy and also kind of build in um, all the different kind of dot combinations that would go with those numbers and then have it show that based on uh, the number. But I didn't do that for this for sake of simplicity. So that's one way that you could use a collision to initiate something um, in your program. And I think that's a pretty common one that you, if it's something where the bolt doesn't have to move somewhere, just like clapping the bolt kind of gets it to do something. So um, then an another couple of events that you could use would be on uh, free fall and on landing. So the bolt knows when it's in free fall uh, because all the accelerometers go to zero. And then it knows when it's landing because it was in free fall and you know that it's not. So it has to be actively falling to be in free fall. And so um, I built this, uh, wrote this program here to show a way that you could potentially use um, that information uh, to help you out. So uh, in this case, we start with uh, main LED turning it to green. And then on free fall, so when it starts falling, so when you drop it, um, it's going to set this variable of time zero to time elapsed. So that's, remember, that's a total time the program has been running. Has run. And you can imagine using this for some kind of like free fall experiment or something like that. Um, so it's going to fall. So you got the bolt, bolt, you dropped it. It's going to fall, fall, fall. And then on landing, on landing, I have a second variable that I created called time one. And I'm going to record that as time elapsed. And so at this point, it's going to be more time because it's been falling for some amount of time. And then I have the bolt scroll text with a string. Uh, first, I have the text time and air equals, and then I take time one, which is basically when it lands, minus time zero when I dropped it. And by taking one of those minus the other, I can get the total time it was in the air, which is a way that you could use these events uh, in, in an experiment if you wanted to do a free fall experiment and get a, a precise kind of measure of how much time it was in free fall. Another one that you can use is on gyro max. Remember that a gyro, the, um, the gyro sensor tells us kind of the rate of spin that we get from uh, the bolt. And the maximum that you could get here is uh, 2000 degrees per second. So that's the maximum um, the bolt can sense. Anything above that, it just tops out and maxes out. And so that happens to be about if you do the calculation, about five and a half rotations per second. Um, easy to achieve as long as your stabilization is off. As long as you turn the stabilization off on the robot, it's easy to get it to spin that quickly. And so you could use that to initiate some kind of behavior uh, in the robot or something that you wanted to do if you just spin it super fast. Um, some of the other events you can do, kind of this on charging and, and not charging, those have to do with uh, the charger we see right here. And I have found a lot of applications for those that um, that are, are super uh, helpful, um, but that doesn't mean they're not out there. Um, so that's just related to whether it's on its charging dock, charging or not. And then we also uh, already talked about on message received, which has to do with comm, communication. And then on start program is basically like the original event. If you haven't noticed yet, all the events, um, they're black, and they also have a little tab under them showing that uh, something's going to happen when that, um, or that they can have code kind of blocked under them. You can see there. So uh, then finally, kind of the last advanced thing that I want to talk about or give a just a, an overview of, um, a beginner's overview, is a function. So in programming a function, is uh, just defining a chunk of code uh, that can be called later as a single entity. So if you have a, it's, it's basically like packaging up something and delivering it in a package rather than, you know, delivering everything loose, which can be kind of awkward if you want to try to deliver, you know, you have like 20 things to deliver to somebody um, 
if you kept them all loose and they're all like small things, it would be difficult to, to like hand them over and or to use them or to take them places. If you put them all in a package or in a bag or something like that, like then it's way easier, right? I mean, that makes sense. So we can do the same thing in programming uh, with functions. So the function is like the package or the bag that you can put stuff in um, so that you can use it uh, and take it places easily. So uh, you go all the way to the right in the Sphere EDU app and you can create a function. Uh, you give it a name, so you can call it up by name later. And then you actually define the function by placing a strand of code under it, which I'll show you on this slide. So you can see right here, um, this is your define block. And so you just put this somewhere uh, and anything that you put under this that's connected is gonna be in that bag or in that function. And so in this case, I have um, a loop that runs five times. Uh, I'm calling it all random because a bunch of random things are going to happen to the bolt when it runs this. It's going to play a random sound. There's a lot of sounds. It's going to light up the back LED. That's a tail light for the random brightness between zero and as bright as it goes. It's going to put the LED matrix uh, in a random color and then it's going to roll the bolt uh, a random direction at a random speed for five seconds. And then it's going to repeat that five times. And because I've defined this function as this, from now on, if I want to run this stuff, which is this kind of big garble of code, all I need to do is call this one function. And so here is an example. If I want to run this, all I have to do now that I've defined this, this is somewhere on my kind of canvas. Um, I just go over to functions. I pull this all random function up and this right here, just a single block now does all of this. And I don't have to write this out every time because I've already defined it. And so this could be helpful if you have like really big programs, um, you could have functions in there to kind of keep the, uh, the programming looking a little bit more tidy. Or if you want to pull and do the same thing like repetitively in your programming, this is a way that you could um, get that done as well. So this is kind of giving you an overview of the, of the more advanced things that you can do in Sphero block coding. Um, and uh, when you use these things, it really makes the programming more flexible and opens up a lot of uh, different possibilities uh, for what the bolts can do.